Every day, scientists are learning more and more about how human brains work and how many of us don't fit into the old-fashioned understanding of how brains should work. But a lot of ideas about parenting and familial relationships still need to catch up to the reality of human variation. Neurological differences are natural, profoundly valuable parts of being in a community together and in being part of a family. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, I am here to explore with you. We are all in this together. Welcome to this episode of Neurodiverging. Thank you so much for being here with me today. If you're new here, I'm Danielle and I'm the autistic parent of one autistic child and one ADHD child, the partner of an ADHD man, and I still have the best cats. Neurodiverging is dedicated to helping neurodiverse folks find the resources we need to live better lives as individuals and to further disability awareness and social justice efforts to improve all our lives as part of the larger world community. If you're interested in learning more, you can click the subscribe button to make sure you're notified when there's a new episode. You can take a look around at the previous podcast episode transcripts on neurodiverging.com and have a listen to all of those. And you can check us out on Patreon, where we have new tiers and new patron rewards and new amazing things if you're interested in learning more. Yes, I am recording this while my children are home, so sorry for the background noise. I appreciate your understanding. Thank you so much to all my patrons for supporting Neurodiverging. Today we're doing something that was patron requested because part of the patron rewards are that you can vote on episode topics that are of interest to you. So this was voted on by my patrons. And as you may or may not know, I am a life coach and I work with a lot of autistic or ADHD folks. And part of the coaching process is offering clients skill building techniques and exercises to improve some aspect of their life or to help them get to a goal that they're interested in achieving. I work with a lot of people who have issues with executive function in particular, which can include issues around prioritizing and organizing tasks, procrastination, difficulty getting started on a project, other similar challenges. These are really common issues with most neurodivergent brains and seem pretty common among those with autism and ADHD. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about two tips that I have for what I'm going to call executive function issues. I'm going to talk more about that framing in just a minute. But executive function, in short, is the phrase that's most often used to describe a person's ability to manage important tasks. It comprises three main areas, flexible thinking, working memory, and inhibitory control. So those three pieces make up executive function. Now, flexible thinking is what it sounds like. It's the ability to try new things, solve problems in new ways, and cope with change. Working memory is pretty complex, but for just this episode, what we need to know is that it refers to being able to access and use the memories that you just acquired within like the last minute. And inhibitory control is basically the ability to stop doing something that you really want to do. So these three pieces, flexible thinking, working memory, and inhibitory control together form executive function. We use them in everyday life for emotional regulation, for keeping track of what we're doing and how long it's taking for paying attention to the task or activity we're supposed to be paying attention to, um, planning and prioritizing, and other similar organizational or procedural details. There are a ton of skills associated with executive function too, like any kind of planning and executing of tasks, uh, self-monitoring and self-control, including emotional awareness and control, time awareness and management, Uh, paying sustained attention to something, those are just some examples of executive function skills. So if you happen to have a brain that has weaknesses in working memory, flexible thinking, or inhibitory control, you're likely to notice difficulties with some of these associated skills too. Before we get too much farther into this discussion, I just want to say something about our goals in this episode. I want to say that 
Um, an inability to prioritize boring tasks over a special interest or even over a decent TV show is not a personal failure. It's not related to lack of willpower, disinterest, or not recognizing the consequences of not finishing something. It's purely related to the chemicals in your brain and the differences in how your brain thinks about the future compared to neurotypical people. It's not a personal failure to have trouble doing things that you think you're supposed to do, okay? It's not something you're failing at doing. Executive function challenges are not related to your will or your want to do something. This is important too for parents of children who might have executive function issues. I'm not saying your kid never never says something is hard just to get out of it, but a lot of times um, it's not related to their willpower. Their inability to do something is not related to their willpower. So when I'm working with a client toward a goal um, of improved executive function, we're aiming for a couple of things. The first is to become aware of what the executive function weaknesses are in the client's experience. After that, we can build a set of supports to reduce the effect those weaknesses are having. What we're not doing is judging the type of functioning we have as good or bad. Honestly, in my opinion, there's no such thing as good or bad executive function. Whether the type of function you inherently have is working for you is related to the environment you live in and the tasks that you're expected to carry out. It's not related to whether your brain and its strengths and weaknesses match some imaginary perfect brain. Because there is no such thing as a good or bad brain. There's no such perfect brain. All we're looking at is whether your unique, wonderful brain is working in the context and environment in which you live. Along the same lines, most of the challenges faced by people with neurodivergent brains, things that are categorized as executive dysfunction by the medical establishment, have a root cause in the anxiety, stress, and lack of support experienced by neurodivergent people every day living in a society formed around neurotypical expectations. We are constantly overwhelmed by a range of everyday factors like our environments, uh, the expectations of our children, our families, our friends, our social groups, our doctors, our therapists, and by our own internalized shame and ableism. Even if you are aware of ableism and you're working on internalized shame, they still sit there and they're always hard to see. They still happen, even to the best of us. If all of the factors causing our overwhelm disappeared overnight, poof, they're gone. Most neurodivergent people would experience a sharp and sudden increase in executive function skills. If you woke up tomorrow and everything external outside of yourself that caused your overwhelm was gone, you would be able to get more done. This is because just like us, executive function skills don't exist in a vacuum. They are inextricably linked to our feelings, our reactions, our thoughts. And all of those things are responses to what's happening in the world around us. As you're considering your own goals and your own priorities, you have to consider if you're judging yourself for not being neurotypical enough. Are you considering your own neurodivergent needs in your goals and priorities? It's always important to remember that if you're not neurotypical, you can't expect to function the same way as a neurotypical person does. By neurotypical standards, there will be things that you are bad, quote unquote, at. And you have to remember that's not your fault. It's not something you are failing at. The world isn't structured to work for or with all kinds of people. As much as we want the world to change and be open to people of all kinds of bodies and brains, right now we live in a world that is built around neurotypical expectations. This means there may be times when you are required to prioritize tasks that are not interesting. You might need to overcome some anxiety-based procrastination or to organize physical objects or tasks in a way that is not completely comfortable for you. And in those cases, there are some strategies that you can use to make it easier on yourself to live in the world and accomplish some of these boring, procrastination-inspiring or uncomfortable tasks. So the whole rest of this podcast is devoted to two approaches or two strategies that I hope will help you find these tasks a little less challenging and a little less uncomfortable. So I'd like to introduce you to two strategies to help strengthen your executive function skills. And these are automation and the activity partner. There are a lot of ways to strengthen executive function skills, but I'm focusing on these because they are the ones that I find work for the most people, the most uh, diverse kinds of brains. And I think they're the easiest to start using today and to implement right away. So before we dive in, I'm just gonna remind you 
Again, to be kind to yourself, don't judge yourself if you have trouble implementing these tips. I hope that these will help you live in the world a little bit more easily, but there are a lot of things that can get in the way. Brains and people are super complex, so try these out and see what works for you. But if they don't work, please don't think it's a failure on your part. It just means there's something else out there that will work better for you and your brain. So if you have any questions, if you have trouble, if you have you know, anything going on, you can always reach out to me via email with questions. I'm very happy to help. Okay, so now we're going to talk about automation. So automation is a way to create new habits in your life that are linked to specific tasks or activities that you already do every day. I've seen automation referred to in a lot of different ways. Um, some other ways you might have seen it talked about are rhythms or micro habits. Um, sometimes checklists are considered automation. The basic idea, though, is to connect a task that you need help remembering to do with something you already do that isn't a challenge for you. We're specifically looking for small habits that are necessary to your well-being. Automation is not going to work nearly as well for bigger goals like I'm going to run five miles every day or I'm going to write an epic novel in a month, right? The key here is small, basic tasks or activities. Once you have those little things down, then you can move on to bigger ones. So I'm going to talk you through a three-step process for incorporating automation into your life. If you would like to see this written down, it is available on the website in the show notes. Uh, the whole transcript is there. So go there, print it out. It'll be there for you. First step to automation is brainstorming. Get your cell phone out with a notepad app or get a piece of paper and say, what are some things that you need to accomplish every day or every three days or every week or whatever period of time? What are some things you need to accomplish? You want to write down some small basic actions that you want to do every day or whatever other period of time. So some examples might be like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, eating meals, doing your five minute PT exercises, making your bed, taking your meds, drinking water, reading for five minutes before bedtime, whatever. Okay. These are small, small things. Now, once you have your list, pick one, one at a time. <laughs> If you try to do eight new things at once, you will overwhelm yourself and you'll never want to try this ever again. And that's not what we're going for here. Okay. This is not what we want. So pick one small task like showering or making your bed because you want it to be something that doesn't take a ton of your mental energy to accomplish. If you start with a really small task, it will be easier to work it into your day. Okay. Start small. Pick one of the things on your list. Now, step two, we're going to connect this to an existing routine. So once you've picked your very, very small task or activity, you're going to connect it to an existing routine. Now, I know a lot of you are going to be thinking like, ah, I don't have any routines. Or I know ADHD folks in particular, I'm looking at you. I know a lot of you will say that you don't like routines. But I also think that a lot of you know that, well, first, routines actually do help you, even though you don't like them. And second... If you think about it, you almost certainly have routines, things that you do every day. You might not do them exactly the same order every day. You might not do them at exactly the same time every day. They might vary slightly, but the chances are there are a few things you do without really thinking about it. Like if you get up at the same time every day, or you walk your dog before dinner, or you brush your teeth before you go to bed, those are routines, okay? So the idea is to find one of these routines, like say getting out of bed, that can link easily with the habit that you wanna add. So if your goal is to make your bed every day, you add that to your getting out of bed routine. Get up, make the bed, right? Whatever the routine is, you're linking it with this new habit that you wanna develop. Step three, celebrate it. This third step is just as important as the previous two for building a successful habit. You must reward yourself. You must, I'm telling you. You, you. you can tell your brain. If your brain is one of those that's like, no, you don't deserve rewards. Well, first of all, you do. Second of all, Danielle told you so. You must, you must reward yourself because Danielle told you that you have to, okay? If your goal is to get up and make your bed, you want to come up with a mini reward that you give yourself every single time you make your bed. This should be something that makes you happy, right? Something that makes you feel good. 
You want to celebrate doing your new habit because it's going to help you look forward to doing it. As an added bonus, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you accomplished the task. So in other words, a reward is going to make it feel less like something you have to do and more like something fun that you're integrating into your day. Okay. It's something that makes you look forward to doing it. So I want to give you a real world example, um, just to kind of cement this for you a little bit. So this is an example from my life. I need help remembering to eat breakfast in the morning. I know it's really basic, (laughs) but there are a lot of things that can get in the way of me remembering to eat. Uh, and remembering to eat enough and eat the right foods and etc. In my case, it takes my brain a really long time to turn on in the morning and I do not have great hunger cues. So obviously my whole day is better though when I eat breakfast because my body like everyone's needs food or energy. So remembering to eat breakfast is something that's important and it's a task I need help with and it's pretty small, right? It's a discrete small task. So it fits really well with automation. Following the steps that I just went over, I identified eating breakfast as a habit that I want to build. And the trick for me is getting the food in front of me. Once it's there, I will eat it. But if I don't remember to put it in front of myself, I will not eat it. So even more than just identifying eating breakfast as a habit, we are further narrowing this into getting the food in front of my face. Okay, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So And obviously in this example, yeah, there's some prior work that needs to happen. There has to be food in the house that I know I will eat, which is its own task. And, you know, sometimes automation means that you're going to build one thing at a time, right? So that's part of the process. But in this example, there's food in the house. I just need to get it in front of my face, okay? So the second step here is to link it to something that I already do. For whatever reason, I realize that this is bizarre, but I will remember to give my kids their vitamins in the morning. I'll get up, I'll wash my face, I'll brush my teeth, and I'll give my kids their vitamins, even though I forgot to eat my own breakfast. So the small task is adding get breakfast onto kids' vitamins. So this way, when I see the bottles of my kids' vitamins, I'll start associating it with making my breakfast. And in linking these two things together... I have a much higher likelihood of remembering to actually eat my breakfast in the morning, okay? So I'm identifying a routine that I already have, which is get my kids their vitamins, and I'm linking it to the task that I need to do, which is get my own breakfast, okay? And then I'm celebrating. My reward for doing this pair of tasks is getting a second cup of coffee because that makes me happy, okay? Your reward doesn't always have to be food. Though it can be, you do you. But for me, I'm very food motivated. Coffee will do it. So I only, I get a second cup of coffee when I successfully eat my breakfast. All right. And that makes me happy. And that makes me want to remember to eat breakfast. So that's how automation works. So a little bit more about this. Um, One purpose of automation is to give your brain little things to do without giving it too much. Um, Like we talked about earlier, your brain is likely already overwhelmed just because you're a neurodivergent person living in this world. And we do not want to add to that. So you must not judge yourself in this process. If you fail to do your newly linked habit one day, do not stress over it. Just do it the next day. Everyone has days where nothing works. There are days I forget to brush my teeth or eat or give my kids their vitamins for that matter. So please be kind to yourself that day and just try again the next day. It's really not a big deal. Now, If you have a bunch of days in a row or a bunch of times in a row where the habit to be just doesn't happen, then it's worth sitting down and thinking about why is it so hard? Are there other aspects to achieving the goal that you maybe didn't consider when you were brainstorming? Like, uh, for example, I might not be eating breakfast because I failed to go shopping. And so maybe what I should be doing is figuring out the getting food to the house issue before I try to figure out the getting food in front of my face issue, right? So sometimes it's an order of operations issue. So think about, is there something else going on that is making this harder than it has to be? Maybe something in your routine has changed that's made it harder to link the two tasks together, right? So maybe my kids don't need vitamins anymore and I might have dropped breakfast for that. So maybe you have to think about your routine again. My experience is though that automation tends to work for a lot of people. The key is really to take the time to brainstorm, to pick the right task and to link it to one of your routines and then reward yourself when you accomplish the tasks. I've also noticed that morning and evening routines tend to have the most successful for people. 
Um, neurodivergent people especially, schedules can be all over the place. You need to figure out what works for you when you're building these linked routines. But for a lot of folks, they have a morning wake up routine and an evening wind down routine. So attaching small things to those routines can be really successful because you already have that routine in place and you're making this one tiny change to it. Okay. So look at your mornings and evenings if you're having trouble narrowing in on routines. Then once you've successfully accomplished your linked habit for a week or so, and you're feeling like it's there and you're not just going to drop it the minute something happens, that's when you can consider adding in another tiny micro habit following the same step. Please remember one at a time, one at a time. Okay. So that is automation, micro habits, rhythms. Okay. Um, The second strategy I want to talk about today is, um, called activity partners. And if you've listened to my episode a couple back, maybe like six back with Reverend Catherine Clarenbach, she and I talked about activity partners in that episode too. So you can check that interview out if you haven't yet. But basically, if you are having trouble starting, completing, or picking a task back up after you started it, um, for a lot of people, external oversight of some kind Even just having someone else in the room with you can provide the necessary nudge to get you going. So having an activity partner is a way to take advantage of this quirk of your mentality, needing oversight, and using it on purpose to get things done. So there are a lot of ways to approach this, and it can be used for large and small tasks alike. For me, an activity partner works the best for physical tasks, like folding laundry, which is something I hate doing. But for a lot of people, it works fine for like electronic computer tasks too. Um, how it works is that a lot of us do really well getting things done if someone is watching us either literally or figuratively. So if one of your tasks is to do the dishes, but you tend to get distracted, um, maybe you remember something else that you need to do, you walk away from the dishes and then they're not done and you're not going to come back and finish them, right? But if someone is in the room with you, you're less likely to walk away initially and not come back to the dishes. So What you can do is basically you're engaging the help of an activity partner um, to help you solve this kind of distractibility issue. These activity partners are also sometimes called shadows or body doubles, um, or even I've heard activity buddy. So those are all words that mean the same thing. And the basic idea is that you have another person in the room with you and you've told them ahead of time what your goal is. So they usually aren't there to help you with actually doing your task, but their presence is helping you stay with your task until it's done. So for instance, if you have a paper you need to write or a presentation that you need to finish up, you and your activity partner can be in the same room and you can be working on your paper while your shadow is doing their own thing, something that isn't distracting to you. And if their presence isn't quite enough, maybe you ask them to occasionally gently check in with you and say, how's it going, Danielle? Are you still stuck on that one thing? Having someone else who knows what you're supposed to be doing and can call you on it if you get off task, but who can also kind of bounce ideas with you can be a huge help. Um, And I think that activity partners are really adjustable to your specific issue and your specific needs. So that's really great. Um, This also works really well over the phone or video chat if the person can't be in the exact room with you. I have a weekly date with a friend where we're in a video chat and we're each doing our own tasks and we may or may not be talking to each other depending on the week we're having. Um, But the point is that we've both set aside the time to get things done, like paying bills or making a grocery list or cleaning up email, or sometimes I'm working on this podcast. And the other person is expecting us to be there at that specific time, which gives us just that little nudge of motivation to get started or finish something up if you've been struggling with it. So it can be a huge help. I want to mention right here before I forget that um, if you are not on my mailing list yet, if you sign up to my mailing list, um, go through the link to neurodiverging.com and find the transcript here and it's right at the top. If you sign up to my mailing list, um, I have a free six page booklet. Uh, It's kind of a workbook about how to choose an activity partner and get the most value out of your time together. It includes information on what an activity partner is, how to use one, and then how to really zero in and narrow in on the details of making the relationship effective and useful for both of you. So if you're interested in that, if you sign up to my mailing list, it is a free booklet that you can get. um, And uh, it's available at neurodiverging.com right now. I hope that was all helpful. 
And I would love to know if you like this episode and want more information about executive function tips or skills, because uh, I've got a lot of them and I can make more. And if you have any favorite executive function tips, send them in to me and maybe we can make like a listener collaborative episode sometime in the future. That would be really cool. So my email is neurodiverging.podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear it from you. Please don't forget to check out neurodiverging.com for the show notes and additional links and for signing up to get that free booklet on choosing an activity partner. And also please check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash neurodiverging. We have a lot of new tiers and new rewards since late April. So if you're interested in coaching resources, self-help resources behind the scenes of the podcast, please go check out the tiers there. We'd love to have you on the Patreon too. Also patrons get any other free stuff that I make for this podcast. So this page, this six page booklet on activity partners and how to find one my getting unstuck check-in that i've offered in the past Uh, patrons have access to all of that the minute you sign up so uh, please go to and become a patron and enjoy access to all that stuff thank you for being here with me today and please remember we are all in this together